Hello everybody. Get talking with someone about sports cars and it won't take long before you have to talk about Porsche. And if you're doing that, it won't take long before you have to talk about the 911 GT3. Once upon a time, the preserve of track day fiends and die-hard 911 enthusiasts, the GT3 has now become the darling of not just the modern classic scene, but the car world in general, with often inexplicable prices being asked, and when it comes to the new ones, people being willing to sell their grandmothers just to get their hold on it. This, though, wasn't always the case, and today I am going back to the beginning, driving the first of the modern iteration of Porsche GT cars. This is the 996.1 GT3, but 25 years after it was launched, does it deserve the reputation that it has? Let's find out. like just recently I have driven an awful lot of this generation of Porsche, not just the 911 but also the Boxster and the later Cayman, and so for the benefit of my viewers who have and also haven't seen those videos, I'm going to keep my introduction present but brief. This is a member of the 996 generation of 911, a critical moment in Porsche history because it was the biggest evolution the car had ever seen changing, amongst other things, from air to water-cooled for an all-new design that launched at the end of the 90s. Then, in 1999, Porsche got serious because they launched this, the GT3. Now, up until that point, Porsche had made special, lightweight, more track-focused 911s. They've been doing so for decades with cars such as the 2.7 RS, potentially the holy grail of 911s. Then later, the likes of the 964, the 993 RS, and, oft forgotten, the 993 GT, the latterly often called the GT2 because it had a turbocharged engine out the back. But for this car, GT3 was more than simply a badge. It was a reminder that this was a genuine homologation special, built to allow the firm to go racing. And so, though at first glance it appears to be a regular 996 generation 911 with a body kit, it is in fact rather more different than that. And let's get straight to the meat of the matter, shall we? Because the thing that differentiated this GT3 most from its regular Carrera sibling is the engine you'll find hung out over that rear axle. Whereas the regular car had a 3.4 litre naturally aspirated flat six, making just shy of 300 horsepower, this had a 3.6 litre flat six, making 360. Which at first doesn't really seem all that different at all. However, configuration aside, the engine here bears absolutely no resemblance whatsoever to that found in the regular Carrera. This is the now famous Metzger lump, and it instead is closer related to that you'd find in a 911 GT1. In some ways, it's an evolution of the old water-cooled lump, and if you're a Porsche Anorak, you can even find relatives in the likes of the 962. It's a very, very special engine. In terms of torque, it's still not a powerhouse, making 273 pounds-feet, that's 370 newton meters. Though I should also remind people that at this point in time, the Ferrari of the day would have been a 360, and that itself didn't make all that much more. The body shells on which these were based were actually those of a C4 rather than a C2, chosen for its extra rigidity and the packaging which meant they could then fit an oil tank up the front, necessitated because unlike the regular Carrera, this was a true dry sump engine. Visually, the changes are then by modern standards fairly subtle, the most obvious of which is this absolutely gorgeous rear wing, which only ever saw service on the first generation of GT3, being replaced for the 996.2 with a, a no doubt more effective but also far less shapely item. 
I've always been particularly drawn to this. I think it's absolutely stunning. It is also a genuinely adjustable item with a few different positions you can put it in to give you a little more downforce. But this one is currently set in its road legal position. At the front, you also have a moderately different treatment for the front bumper with a new little splitter below it. And if you want an easy way to tell a GT3 apart from a look-alike, one of the best ways is to look at that front bumper. Because on a regular Carrera, you will typically only have an opening on the left and the right. The center one is closed. But on a GT3, it is also open to help the car with its cooling requirements. On the side, the car then has a very subtle but still rather nice side skirt and these bespoke for the GT3 split rim 18 inch alloys, which again, by modern standards, are very, very subtle. The car then has the other refinements you may expect of a GT model, so lower, stiffer, more track orientated suspension, and it has better brakes too. It even has a different six speed manual, this one being taken from that 993 GT. You could have also had the car in one of two specifications, either Comfort, as we have here, or Club Sport, I believe a no-cost option. And that got you bucket seats in place of these regular items, which I think aren't even the sports ones. You also had a half cage and a fire extinguisher. Though it's worth noting, the Americans, I think, never got that option. Today, the Club Sports are seen as the more desirable, although purists will tell you that there is something to be said for the Comfort too, because it's actually marginally lighter. In any case, a quarter of a century on, you'll now find many comfort cars that have been converted to club sport. You'll also find many regular 996s that have been made to look like a GT3. But the fact is, you can do a lot to make one look like a GT3. You'll never get it to feel like a GT3. And that is evident the moment you turn the key. Because where a regular 996 sounds very, very good, this is really quite purposeful. Even more so if you do go for that club sport option, which also gives you a single mass flywheel, another option that many cars have later adopted. But remember, the point of the GT3 was never to impress your friends. It was never to tell people you'd spent as much money as you possibly could have on a 911. That came a little later with the arrival of the turbo and the turbo-based GT2. Instead, the purpose of a GT3, and the reason it forged its legend, is for the way it makes you feel. A 911 is an already very good road car. This is supposed to be something quite spectacular. So is it? Let's find out. This car is absolutely magical. Now we might as well start with that engine. I know on paper yeah, it's got another 60 horsepower over the regular car, but today 360 horsepower wouldn't even satisfy a hot hatch enthusiast. But it's the way it goes about its business. The red line is set at about seven and a half thousand, but it feels like it wants to just keep going. It's got punch all the way through and it's just so eager makes a great noise too this car is more or less mechanically standard the sole modifications being an uprated exhaust which has been modified by carnival over in belgium and fitted with a pair of sports cats plus their back box modifications otherwise in terms of performance the car is as standard in the handling department the only change then has been the addition of a camber kit 
And this car is no garage queen either. It's currently sat on 131,000 miles. It was picked up by Peter and his friend about 13 years ago because they wanted something to take on track days and the occasional road trip. Now when they got it, it already had 116,000 miles on it, one of the previous owners having commuted from Reading to Bristol in it, I'm told. But they haven't put anywhere near as much on it, instead they've used it as and when they wanted to, and though Peter tells me in the last couple of years it hasn't got out all that much, even taking it out this morning he's reminded of just how special it is and why he has absolutely no intention of selling it. Five minutes behind the wheel myself, and I know exactly why he wouldn't. It's not just because he didn't pay anywhere near as much for this as they're worth now, but it's the fact that this really is quite a special thing. That pace, that performance, not only is it exciting, but it's just right for the road. You can have fun and you can pick up a lot more speed than you think you have, but it doesn't give you that, oh my word, I'm going to prison feeling that many other modern cars do, including the current crop of GT3s. And then we get onto that chassis. Now around town, it is quite a bumpy, lumpy thing. Turning circles, okay, not great, though I'm sure you don't care. And remember, for this generation, the Dot 1, there was no GT3 RS. That came later with the Dot 2, and it's been forever since I've driven one of those. And in fact, if you're watching this video now, and you have another GT3 or 911 or anything else of any description you'd like to see on the channel, please do drop me a line. My email address is in the description of every video. It's talk at jm.com. So with that in mind, you can kind of understand this car being a little firmer, but in all honesty, it's not actually horrendous. It's not crashy, it's not terrible, but you do have to watch out for potholes and the like. It also sits relatively low, and when you combine it with that new front splitter, you do have to be cautious, particularly in the likes of multi-storey car parks, over speed humps. These are cars that are quite easy to do a bit of damage to. Fortunately, that splitter comes off fairly easily, and isn't all that expensive. Next up, let's talk about that handling, shall we? I recently did a video on a regular 993 Carrera 2, in which I spoke a little bit about what makes 911 so special. But having just edited that video, I've decided I didn't do the topic anywhere near enough justice. What is it then that makes them so well loved? It's the fact that a 911, because of its inherent layout, doesn't have all that much weight over the front, and therefore the power steering doesn't need that much assistance. That means it can be both light and communicative. Now for stuff like the 993, which doesn't have much assistance at all, at low speeds it is very, very heavy. But once you've got a little bit of speed on the go, it's actually not all that bad. It's a very easy car to drive. This certainly has a little bit more help in the rack. It's also got larger boots all around. Two 25s at the front and two 65s at the back. Tiny by modern standards. However, it's still got that same weight balance. This is something like 62% biased to the rear. Although, if you were thinking the GT3 was also the lightest of all 996s, you'd actually be wrong because for this generation, it was some 30 kilos heavier than the plain old 996C2. And they're all quite basic cars. These don't even have a glove box in them. Instead, the manual goes in a, a little slot underneath the wheel, which also doesn't have much adjustment in it. All in, this car weighs around 1,380 kilos. To put it another way, the same as a 360 Challenge Stradale. Although in fairness, that car is better compared with the GT3 RS, which landed at more or less the same time, around 2003 to 2004. I'm getting distracted again, aren't I? Right, that steering. It's light, but it's feelsome. The big surprise for me though, having been driving recently a lot of more modern cars, is how slow the rack is. Yes, it's beautifully feelsome, and it does actually have a nice off-center response. But once you're in a bend, you find yourself turning the wheel a lot more than you think you should, even at higher speeds. 
but after a few minutes you do slowly begin to get used to it and you begin to appreciate the slightly less hypersensitive rack. There are a few modern cars I've driven where after a while it, it can get a little bit tiring. And then, before you've even realised that it's happened, this car has done that thing that only the absolute best, the pinnacle, the greatest sports cars ever can achieve. And that's vanish. By which I mean, you suddenly realise that you're not thinking about the car anymore. It's just you, the road, and it feels like there isn't anything in between. Every press of that cable operated throttle, every dab of those beautiful, nice, not very heavily servoed at all brakes, every touch of that gear lever, it's just natural. The car does precisely what you tell it to and nothing more. Which is just as well, because things it doesn't have include the likes of stability or traction control. And in fairness, on a nice dry day, like we've sort of got today, there's a good chance they're not necessary. Many say that the 360 horsepower this car claimed was actually a little bit optimistic. The 380 of its successor then may be a little bit pessimistic, and so the performance gap between the two is often cited as being a little bit larger than Porsche would like you to believe. But let's be honest here for a second, shall we? These are fairly expensive cars for the performance on offer. 60 odd thousand pounds seems to be the entry point into a 996. Frustratingly, for the purposes of research, I couldn't actually find many GT3.1s for sale full stop only about two at present, and both of those were very low mileage examples, so commanding quite the premium. There were a lot more dot twos, and that's partly because they were a more popular car. Just 100 of these made it to the UK as an official C16 car. That's the Porsche designation for a UK bound vehicle. Worldwide, they made a few more, but in total, there were only something like 1800 of this GT3 ever made, compared to what people believe is more like 10,000 of the current generation. Porsche, for perhaps obvious reasons, don't tell people anymore just how many GT3s they've made. Much like the 996 on which it is based, this car is also ridiculously narrow. In fact, when you park it in a car park next to anything modern, not just anything modern and sporty, but just modern full stop, like Nissan Qashqai's, it looks like it's in a funhouse mirror. It just looks like it's breathing in the whole time. And it might look a bit daft for it, but when you're then out on the road, it gives you so much more adjustability, so many more options for taking a line through a bend without even having to get onto the wrong side of the road. Whether it's because it is a different gearbox, or maybe it's just this particular example, I couldn't tell you, but the action of this gearbox is lovely. The throw is sort of medium in length, but very precise. There's not all that much play in it, and it's not too heavy either. Many that I drive now, they, they feel a bit bulky, not very cooperative. This one though, that's lovely. subtle but when pressing on you get that engine to about five and a half thousand rpm it gives you that last lunge and then that final two thousand of the engine's rev range it is just spectacular though in truth you could change up at about five and still make very good progress indeed it's a flexible power plant this one 360 horsepower has rarely felt more adequate What you then do to extract the absolute best from these cars is you have the lightest grip you can get away with on the wheel and you allow it to talk to you. That front end is constantly moving, there's a, a pitter patter of those front wheels and that sensation of the car vanishing from under you I think is largely because the feel you get from this wheel. It just tells you what's on the road surface, it feels almost like you're reaching your hands out and pressing down on the tarmac only with far, far less disastrous consequences. It's not quite as ludicrously communicative as, say, the 964 RS, 
but it's still really very good. And I must be honest, I did come into today's review somewhat tentative because the last time I drove a 996 GT3, it was a modified Manti racing example up in Scotland. And I seem to recall I enjoyed it, the roads weren't right for it, that car also sat a little bit too low, so it kept scraping the ground. And um, I don't remember coming away from it going, yes, I must have one of these. Latterly, I've then driven a lot more of the modern GT3s, which have become, well, wild, to be perfectly honest. The 992 in particular, it, it no longer feels like a 911 to me. It feels more like an R8. It's just got grip, grip, grip for days. And though, yes, this certainly has more than you probably need most of the time, you can still feel that on the road you can and will approach the limits of it. It's just communicating to you so much more clearly what's going on, and you have a lot more fun at much lower speeds. That 992, or you go quick, and you don't really realise it. And another issue these cars face, the weirdness of the Porsche market, the GTs in particular. Like I said, you could pick one of these up if you found it with high miles for maybe very high 50s, more likely low 60s, but spend only a little bit more, sort of 75 to 80, you'll get yourself into a 997 GT3, a very different car, considerably quicker with a much nicer exterior and interior. Though I do still have a soft spot for this generation in particular, it's that wing, it really is that wing. Then spend only a little bit more than that, so up to say 85 to 90,000 pounds, and you're getting into a 991.1 GT3. And that's a whole different animal. That will keep up with some fairly exotic stuff. You're talking nigh on 500 horsepower by that point. A PDK gearbox, a much wider, bigger, more aggressive car, one that is far more capable and still very, very exciting. Yes, I know it has issues of its own. And one of the things that really did affect the easing when it shouldn't have was the issues that faced many regular 996s engine ones in particular. This, by having a different engine, like the turbo, never suffered those problems, but still they depreciated anyway. And there was a time you could pick something like this up for well, nearly 25 grand. I remember seeing examples for sale at dealers for 30 to 35, and that was the later Club Sport equipped Dot Twos. They weren't particularly expensive cars because they simply weren't as desirable as they are now. And today, this sort of money would get you into a very nice 981 GT4. And if you wanted something easy to live with, that's probably a better choice. More modern interior, more modern up-to-date infotainment, though you can now get a system from Porsche for these. And it's not got a GT engine granted, but it is going to be a lot quicker than this and you can still get it with a manual gearbox. Great looking cars too. I love the 981 GT4, but this does feel just that little bit more special to me. And I guess when you're talking about cars like this, I mentioned it already, this is not a very good way to go fast for £60,000. Get yourself into an R35 GTR instead. Heck, a 997 Turbo. This isn't even far off 991 Turbo money. I saw a Turbo S for sale for £80,000 earlier. And they're going to be a lot quicker. But I've driven those cars, and they're just not going to make you feel like this does. You want to do big miles, you want to do the road trips and all that stuff, get the Turbo. It's still a fantastic car. 997.1, that is my pick of the bunch. But for the business of driving, for that getting from A to B with a smile on your face, Done. Sold. I love it. And so I want to say a big thank you to Peter for bringing it out. He's now had it for 13 years, has no interest whatsoever in getting rid of it. In that time, it hasn't really even given him too much grief. The biggest issue he ever had was when the throttle cable snapped, and then when he had to do some work to fix that, they found a few other issues with the car, hoses needed to be sorted, but the fact is, this is a 25-year-old car now. This particular model, 24 years old, but you get my meaning. They'll need maintenance, they'll need work done. If you are going to buy one, please look for evidence that it has been cared for and used, and please, 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 don't go and buy a super low mileage one that hasn't gone anywhere, pay a premium for it, and then try and drive it, because I guarantee you, 
that's probably going to give you quite a bit of grief. Instead, get one that's been used and enjoyed, but not abused, and I think you'll have an excellent time indeed. So, that is the 996.1 generation Porsche 911 GT3. A very, very pleasant surprise indeed. And if you do happen to have a high mileage one in speed yellow that you may be thinking of moving on, give me a shout, will you? Anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget, like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.